This is the Next Normal Podcast. We engage in conversations with experts from various industries to help you future-proof yourself in a rapidly changing world. My name is Maria Vasileo, and I'm joined by my co-host, Alicia Mirage. Our guest today is Isaac Olaolafe. He is the founder of DreamMaker Developments, which specializes in locating land development opportunities in growth areas. He is also the founder of DreamMaker Ventures, which is an organization that invests in entrepreneurs and innovative technologies. This is part two of our two-part discussion with Isaac. In our previous episode, our conversation focused on the current state of real estate. In today's episode, we focus on what real estate looks like post-COVID-19 and the necessary restructuring that needs to take place within the sector. We hope you enjoy it. And on that note of re-architecturing um, and using different lenses, you mentioned the importance of using a health lens so that your, your employees are, are safe. Another lens that has come to the forefront is that of um, a climate action lens. Um, so if we were to drill a little bit more into um, the impending climate emergency where the World Economic Forum has noted that, you know, developers and investors will have to rethink design and purpose and sustainability of buildings to be greener, more resilient, because um, as we all know, buildings account for about a third of global mm-hmm. greenhouse gases emissions and about 40% or so of the world's energy. Um, I'd love to hear what are some of the things that you've seen about how buildings are being re-architectured and reinvented. And then on top of that, I know that you have a background of investing in very innovative technologies and, and entrepreneurs. So I'd love to hear what are some of the cool innovations that excites you in this space if we were to um, apply a climate awareness lens. Yeah, no, great, great question. And you know, one of our one of the developers that uh, we we do a lot of business with on the on the investment side is um, is Tridel, um, and and Tridel is is one of the top development firms from a lead certification um, point of view and a and a green building um, point of view, and they've been they've been preaching that for for many for for many years now, and and for us and and in general when you when you look at it in terms of the way. Um, building structures are going to be different from the type of materials that are that are used. Um, we've seen it even with the with the windows um, and the glass that are used um, for for some of our buildings as well too, for the low rise and for the high rise, mid rise um, buildings that we've that we've done, or even on the green roofs um, on a lot of the buildings right now. Um, even there's some some buildings that are using more geothermal um, as well as well too. Uh, which is more from an energy energy efficiency um, as well. But from the prop tech um, point of view, you know, there's a few companies that we've looked at that are utilizing technology um, when it comes to to architecture, when it comes to design, uh, when it comes to um, the way information is transferred from one trade um, to the other. So not necessarily from a client point of view, but just from the overall um, operations of, um, of running a construction business, um, especially with, when it comes to communication. Um, so we definitely see technology playing more and more as a role uh, within, the tech, uh, within the construction and real estate space. And, and we see prop tech um, as a space that's going to be growing more, uh, where you're going to see a lot of more companies coming out of that, uh, that space and a lot of more money uh, from LPs flowing into that, into that space as well. Okay, and just for listeners, prop tech really is property technology. Correct. Yes, exactly. Okay. Alicia had mentioned that there needs to be a reinventing of spaces. Yes. One could say there also needs to be a restructuring of the real estate market, particularly in terms of race issues. For example, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation recently announced policy reviews and initiatives to fight racism within the real estate environment. This will include their hiring and business practices. For the context of our listeners, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation presently has no Black or Indigenous vice presidents or senior vice presidents. And in an undercover investigation in Long Island, they actually found that real estate agents treated people of color unequally by up to 40% of the time. An example of this is that one real estate agent told the black man that houses in a predominantly white neighborhood were too expensive for his budget, but showed those same houses in the same neighborhood to a white man with a similar budget without any issue or comment. Hmm. 
and I know this is an American statistic, an American uh, investigation, though I, the same I feel can be said to the Canadian ecosystem because we are fairly similar. What are your thoughts on this announcement and what steps would you like to see them take in order to tackle this form of systemic racism within the real estate market? Yeah, no, great, great question. And it's um, interesting times and it's good to see corporate Canada um, sort of stepping up and, and acknowledging the, the lack of diversity within the corporate bodies, uh, within, within management staff and within employment in general. Representation is so key, especially in public and crown corporations um, that are serving the general public as a whole. It's, it's always good to have the representation uh, within those entities, um, whether you go to a university, uh, whether you go to a bank, and again, uh, CMHC, um, being a crown corporation and, and working with the general public under for mortgages, um, Within the Black community, there's, um, in Toronto, I think it's over 10% um, identified uh, within the Black community. And in Canada, across the board, it's 3.55%. Um, so, you know, there is, that is a pretty, pretty impacting number when you look at the fact that you said there's no uh, individuals, both from the Aboriginal or Black community, on any of their boards. Um, and so when you look at programs that may come out or initiatives that may come out, um, for the general public, you're not able to get that perspective uh, from somebody that comes from that community. Um, that's why, you know, they always say diverse groups, diverse um, companies and diverse boards um, have a higher chance of being successful um, in this new economy um, and have a higher chance of providing solutions that is impacting to the general public as a whole. Um, so it's very important for an organization um, like CMHC to be able to, to have more representation um, for the, the customers that they're serving um, as well too, because it's the programs um, and the policies that are rolled out um, that would impact directly or indirectly a family that's from the black community, um, which predominantly already has lack access um, to financing, um, lack access to, um, to, to, um, to investments, uh, so when there's policies being put in place uh, and there's nobody within the company to be able to put that on the table um, for, for them to look at as they're creating these policies, um, then a policy will come in place that doesn't help um, that situation. So I think it's very important um, that, that all corporations that are serving um, the public in general um, has proper representation with all levels of government so that they could get a different perspective. Uh, when they're coming out with new products, new solutions, and new policies at all. I, I think that's really important. And in fact, the research shows that um, diversity um, results in companies being up to six times more innovative. Um, so directly feeding into your point of you, you'll be more successful and you'll be able to um, to impact the entire stakeholder group that you're responsible for if you Correct. have that um, built into built into your board built into your organization and built into your thought process um i wanted to ask you so we know that this podcast has been created to help listeners to to be innovative to get a sense of what the future might hold and prepare themselves um so it's not fair for me to ask you this um but Assuming you had a crystal ball, assuming that we could fast forward into the future, what do you think the sector would look like? Or, um, or if you wanted an easier question, what would you like it to look like? Wow. So if you, if you look back, you know, if you look for 10 years, where would the real estate sector be? You know, definitely in, in areas like Toronto would be expensive. Uh, we definitely see the, the cost. The cost of construction um, ha has gone up, but then on the on the flip side, um, we're seeing different types of construction that are happening, uh, modular construction as well too, which is actually going to provide a bit of affordability um, in certain locations. And again, this is where the government plays a role in in the lands that they currently own, um, in doing development partnerships uh, with the private sector on creating uh, more affordable housing. Um, so I think in 10 years, even though you'll have pockets of very expensive properties uh, within major cities, 
Um, if the government continues to play a positive role as they have been trying, um, you'll see more affordable housing in those locations as well too, um, as different types of housing will come about like modular, like modular housing as well too. Um, uh, you'll see a more impact on technology um, as well too within the real estate space um, with, with most of the housing being fully tech, tech driven um, from how you enter the house um, from, from how you utilize your, your home when you're inside the home, um, keyless, um, and when it comes to um, managing the temperature, you're already seeing that right now, all the smart home features. So we see that will be doubled down and, and be more of an impact in all housing, um, and especially more of the, the multi-units, the condominium units um, as well too. And depending on, again, on how the impact on the government when it comes to green belt, uh, the, the green belt, um, you'll see more homes uh, being built out, um, especially in an area like the GTA with a large concentration of immigration. Um, people migrating here, over 200,000 people coming. Uh, more housing is going to be definitely needed um, unless the prices are just going to be unaffordable for, for the population. Um, so again, I think the government will play a big role in seeing how affordability um, could could happen within the within the major cities. Um, technology will have a big a big impact as well too, and the types of homes um, that people are living in will will have a big impact. And those are some of the changes that we'll see in the next ten years. With that vision of the future, what would a listener who is thinking of either becoming a and a real estate investor or a realtor or a, a tech founder focusing on um, real estate, what are some of the things, either the skill sets or the expertise that they will need for that 10 year, um, for that 10 year vision? Um, I think from a technology point of view is seeing how AI will be incorporated um, into, into housing, um, into construction. Um, from the construction side, seeing what technology will continue to advance communication uh, within the tech space um, from the technology side, seeing the interactions uh, between a few different bodies uh, from interactions between tenants um, and landlords, um, how that could be improved. Um, the interaction from individuals trying to buy their home. So from a lending point of view, we see FinTech um, have, um, improving um, the, the accessibility for people to buy homes. Uh, we're already seeing it uh, uh, right now in terms of fractional ownership. Um, so that technology uh, and, the, and the solutions around the fractional ownership model, um, utilizing technology around that. Um, you know, even currency as well too, you know, in terms of transaction of properties, you know, so using whether it's Bitcoin, crypto, what type of uh, currency that, that will be used to actually do the transaction, uh, more transaction online. Um, so online transactions and what policies will be put in place. Um, so it's, it's, there's going to be so many different, um, so many different things that will be put in place over the next five to 10 years that will create new opportunities uh, where it will take away from the traditional way of how construction was done on how real estate was transacted um, to now more of a tech driven uh, manner um, that again, from the construction side, the communication piece um, on, on how trades are communicating from the operation size of the property once it's, uh, once it's built um, as well too. Amazing. With, with so many moving parts uh, yes. in terms of operations, tech, FinTech, accessibility, uh, what would your advice be to people who are selling, who are buying and also investors? Because those are three very different categories. What would, you, what would your advice be for them? So in the current market for, for investors, um, Definitely, again, it comes down to the fundamentals. Uh, when you look at the fundamentals of Toronto as a whole in Canada, I think Toronto has done very well on, on how they've been able to manage um, the, the whole COVID pandemic. Um, and as a result of that, you know, people are looking at, at the city, looking at the country and saying, you know what, it was already a city and a country that you wanted to, to come to, migrate to. Um, it's now increased their interest. Um, that indirectly is just going to drive um, the need for housing. Um, so if you're looking to invest, um, I think it's still a good time to invest in Toronto um, for, for buyers. Um, again, it comes down to affordability and, and buying within, within your budget, within your means, and being able to sort of adjust 
um, the, the type of property that you buy. But I think where we're seeing a shift is to the suburban areas um, because now if individuals are, and employees are able to work from home uh, more, then the need to live in the city um, doesn't become as, as, um, as important, um, which will now create uh, opportunities for more communities to be created outside, outside a community. And as long as transportation is following suit, um, I think you'll see the, the GTA expand um, even wider um, in terms of people looking more outside of the Toronto core uh, when buying a, buying a property. Um, for sellers, this is definitely not a seller's, seller's market um, as a result of the less listings. But one thing that we've seen in, in the GTA is that we haven't seen a sharp decrease in pricing. Um, we've only seen more so of a uh, in decrease on the rent. Um, and that's indirectly impacted to um, the slowdown on short-term rental, Airbnb rentals, uh, which has sort of forced a lot of investors that had short-term rental to now move it into the, the regular rental market um, and the long-term rental market, which has now created a lot of inventory. Um, and as a result of that, has dropped down the, the rental rates, um, which I believe just temporarily. Um, I think once things start to get to a, to a new normal, you'll, you'll see um, vacancy rates drop um, again, and you'll see uh, more slight increases in, in rental rates. I, I saw a statistic, I believe, and there were the number of sales between this month and last month actually increased by something around like 40, 50%. So there is still a demand, there's still people selling, that people are still interested yeah. in the Toronto market. It's, it doesn't seem as if it's going away. Exactly. Yeah, they were like Toronto market was supposed to be uh, this this year was supposed to be a big year. Uh, there was a lot of pent up demand from 2019 um, because, you know, I think it was late 2018, early 2019 with the stress test that was in um, put in on the on the market. So it really it really impacted a lot of people trying to get into the market. Um, then they loosened the stress test um, a little bit. And there was a lot of people that were sitting on the sidelines sort of waiting for the market to crash. And because it didn't crash, they realized, okay, they need to get back into the market. So we were actually anticipating a very strong spring market um, before COVID hit. But that doesn't mean that the buyers aren't still there, um, that people don't still have a demand or interest in investing in Toronto. So we, we believe that once um, the uncertainty of where um, COVID is going and the uh, vaccines and, and everything around that and managing it, um, you'll see uh, more transactions happening and more dollars flowing back into the market. It, it's, it would be very interesting to, to disaggregate that demand by whether it's housing versus condos versus commercial properties, um, because I imagine that they're, they're um, experiencing very different demand rates. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think right now is housing, uh, more in the outskirts of the city, um, and then condos from an, still from an affordability point of view. Um, and then, and then a commercial. Can I, can I ask one question around, it, it sounds like there's a lot of, there's a very positive outlook for where Toronto might be in five to 10 years. If you could make a comparison to another city, I know we're already at a pretty big space, but if you could make a comparison to another city around the, globally um, that we might, we might be competing with in terms of growth rate, in terms of where we've, um, we've gotten to, what would you say that city is? Well, not necessarily in terms of growth rate, but in terms of, again, the same fundamental factors will definitely be like a New York. Okay. Um, so, so you, I five to ten well, I don't think we'll ever be at a, at a price per square feet of a New York unless New York stops growing in price per square feet as well, too. So like 10 to 15 years ago, I was always saying Toronto is the next New York. And I sort of changed that thought by saying, Toronto is going to be a major city like New York because it would never be like New York that already has a head start and also continues to become very expensive as well too, right? So when you look at it even from a tech point of view and Toronto being Silicon Valley North, um, will Toronto be the next Silicon Valley? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, Silicon Valley has a big head start in terms of how they build their eco ecosystem, but but what is fair to say is that Toronto is going to be a major city when it comes to tech and innovation. And Toronto is going to be a major city when it comes to international investors wanting to put their money into 
um, real estate, which is only going to mean driving the real estate market, right? So immigration is going to indirectly drive the real estate market. Tech and innovation is indirectly going to be able to drive the real estate market. So as a result of that, the long-term um, ability for real estate to grow is, is very healthy. Our last question. So yes. out of everything, out of everything that we've discussed or perhaps something we didn't touch on, what are you personally most excited about for the future of real estate or real estate investing? Yeah, for me, we're, we're excited about how DreamMaker could really grow into an asset management company, um, both for investors on the real estate side and on the tech side. Um, and we're excited to be able to be doing this in Toronto. Uh, you know, when we look for you know, five to 10 years from now, where Toronto will be from a major city. It's already a major city, yet it's still a city that's growing. Um, it's still a city that is, um, has a lot of demand uh, from an immigration point of view. So you know, we're excited to be right in the deep of it, not only as an investor, but a builder as well too. Um, and also creating the, the infrastructure for other investors uh, to be able to tap into our, our infrastructure. Amazing. We, I feel like I just got a PhD in real estate. So thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for joining us. And thank you. Um, thank you for letting us pick your brain um, for, for such a long time. Absolutely. It's great questions. And thanks again for the invite. Thank you, Isaac. <laughs>